Thank you. Well, happy Tuesday. I believe it's Tuesday. Um, it's the second session of our PPCL perinatal mental health tele-echo. I'm going to welcome everyone. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Um, this is our first series of the perinatal echo program. So welcome. Some of you may be familiar with our uh, pediatric, but welcome to our perinatal. I'm Jody West. I'm the coordinator for today's echo. And I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, I've already asked and folks have been doing, please enter your information into the chat just so we can make sure to get attendance information to you. Um, this is our agenda today. We do our best to stick to it. It is a short amount of time and we have a lot of information. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of announcements and then our facilitator, Dr. Olivier, is going to lead us in introductions. Um, then Dr. Juliana Finelli is going to present the didactic and then our case presentation will be by Jen Bordelon today. And then we'll open it up for any clarifying questions um, from the attendees and the hub team as well. So we want to go ahead and introduce everyone to our hub team, which is the group of folks that coordinate this program. Um, like I said, my name is Jody West. I'm the coordinator for the ECHO, but I'm also the program manager for the provider to provider consultation line. That is the program that sponsors these educational sessions. Um, another part of the services that PPCL can and does provide is free mental health consultation to perinatal as well as pediatric providers. Um, it is statewide, it is free. We do not take over the care of patients, but we can connect you to resources if that is what you're seeking. We can also connect you to psychiatrists if you have a question about medication or need guidance in diagnosing or treatment. Um, if you scan this QR code, it will bring you to um, our website, which gives you more information. And if you register, which should take a few moments, um, we'll be able to get you uh, get information to you about upcoming trainings, uh, program changes, as well as just our newsletter that we send out twice a month about what's going on with the provider to provider consultation line, including these echo sessions. So that's me. Um, I let Dr. Olivier go ahead and lead us in introductions of the team, please. Sure. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Olivier. I'm a child and adolescent and adult psychiatrist here in Lafayette, Louisiana. I'm in private practice for Bloom Mental Wellness. I'm the facilitator for this ECHO session, so I will be making sure that we run on time. Um, and I'm also going to quickly introduce our hub team members to you. Um, and just thank y'all for returning. I saw some uh, returning faces. And so thank y'all for joining us today and giving us your lunch break. But you already met Jody, who is our program coordinator. Um, I'm gonna ask Dr. Finelli to introduce herself. Sure, thanks Dr. Olivier. I'm Juliana Finelli. So I'm a, a, a perinatal psychiatric consultant for PPCL. Um, and I also am a child and adolescent psychiatrist uh, and general psychiatrist at Tulane. Thank you. And you're also leading our didactic in a few minutes. Um, That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Libby. <laughs> All right. Katie Abair. Hi, everybody. I'm Katie Abair. I am a licensed clinical social worker and also perinatal mental health certified. And I have a perinatal private practice um, here at Bloom Mental Wellness. Thanks, Katie. Uh, and also, Dr. Zena, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Paula Zena. I am a, a pediatric nurse as well as a, a pediatric uh, psychologist. I have lots of experience in infant and early childhood and perinatal mental health, especially uh, through work in home visitation in Louisiana, as well as with other projects. I'm happy to be a part of this group. <clears throat> Thank you. And also on our team is Lena Raguette, but speaking of perinatal mental health, she is out on maternity leave, so she'll be joining us in a, in a month, uh, a little while down the road. Um, we're going to go right into the didactic session with Dr. Finelli. So for about the next 20 minutes, she is going to teach us and introduce us to perinatal mental health. Great. Thanks, Dr. Olivier. Thank you for whoever's managing the slides. I appreciate you. Um, so uh, again, Juliana Finelli, and, and I work with uh, PPCL on the perinatal side, um, providing perinatal psychiatric consultation. Um, and this is, we just have these 15 minutes. So uh, this is a very not exhaustive kind of introduction. And I really focused on perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Um, but I, I wanted to make a, an important but brief note about inclusive language. 
We know that not all birthing people identify as women or as mothers, and inclusive language is, is an important step in reducing healthcare inequities. I am going to be citing some studies here um, that basically are specific to people who were assigned female sex at birth and assumed to identify as, as women or mothers, and we know that data are lacking overall for people who are transgender or gender diverse. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. I wanted to just um, just briefly, you know, before we get into talking about uh, perinatal mental health, uh, just talk a little bit about pregnancy and the perinatal period. Um, pregnancy and childbirth were found psychological, physiological challenges that are faced by a human adult. Um, there was a study that described the, the changes in like metabolic rate uh, that are typical of pregnancy as being, quote, at the limits of human physical capability. There's pretty much no system in the body that doesn't modify its function to adjust to the demands of pregnancy. And of course, it's also a time of profound psychological change. Um, and it's a time of profound social change. Really, it changes how but when someone becomes pregnant, it changes how the world sees that person, how they interact with that person. It often changes all of our relationships, um, not to mention the changes in our financial situation or our employment. Uh, unfortunately, we know that pregnancy is actually a high risk time for intimate partner violence. Nearly 20% of women experience violence during pregnancy and homicide is a leading cause of pregnancy associated death in Louisiana. Uh, and we just have to acknowledge that reproducing women are increasingly subject to scrutiny, surveillance, and regulation by strangers, by each other, uh, by the state. And so it's important to acknowledge these, these profound changes that occur when we talk about mental health. Uh, next slide, please. So we also know that there's really significant care gaps. I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here. I know that a lot of folks here joining this are aware of these gaps. Um, but mental health problems as a whole are the most common complication of pregnancy. They affect up to 20% um, of people in the perinatal period. That statistic um, is higher among patients who experience low income or people of color. Despite how common mental health problems are, studies suggest that less than half of patients who have perinatal mental health problems are actually identified by their frontline physician. And then even when patients are identified, we know that perinatal people are undertreated compared to their non-pregnant, non-perinatal counterparts. 75%, according to one study, of patients experience, who are experiencing mental health system uh, symptoms in the perinatal period go untreated. And the fact is just that there's just not enough. Uh, there's not enough mental health clinicians, there's not enough psych psychiatrists to care for all of the patients who have mental health issues. And that's part of why our consultation program exists. So we have significant workforce shortage. We have a significant access problem. And then finally, pregnant people are overall just underrepresented when it comes to clinical research and clinical training. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. We'll touch a little bit more about perinatal mental health disparities. Um, so we do have studies that suggest that Black and Hispanic women are at higher risk for postpartum depressive symptoms. And we also see um, some pretty significant racial and ethnic differences when it comes to mental health care after delivery. Um, and so this study from 2011 found uh, that, that patients who uh, are Black or Hispanic are less likely to receive follow-up treatment, less likely to refill a psychiatric prescription, um, and we see lower rates of initiating treatment. Uh, some more recent data, this is from PRAMS, uh, Pregnancy Risk um, Assessment Monitoring System. Patients who felt upset due to experience, experiencing racism in that year before delivery had twice the odds of, of having depression in the postpartum period. Um, and then we also have to acknowledge uh, disparities when it comes to socioeconomics. So uh, more than half of all infants who are living in poverty are also uh, being raised by, by a mother who has some form of depression. Um, next slide, please. And I'm sort of rushing through these. And this matters because perinatal depression impacts two generations. It impacts the, the pregnant person, the perinatal person, and it also um, can have an impact on the, the developing infant. So looking just at pregnancy, um, perinatal depression is associated with preterm birth, low birth weight, higher rates of emergency C-section, and of course, maternal suicide. Um, and then when we look at infant outcomes, we also see um, some negative outcomes associated with perinatal depression, including social difficulties, even biological changes like EEG asymmetry, which itself is a marker um, of kind of susceptibility for um, negative affect and depressed mood, um, and sleep difficulties. And we think that um, some of those outcomes are at least partially mediated by parenting challenges that we also see associated with perinatal depression. Um, differences in interactions, fewer interactions overall, interactions that might be more irritable or disengaged, 
um, less responsive caregiving, so uh, uh, decreased sensitivity to infant cues. Um, but also we see um, differences when it comes to health behaviors, including things like use of car seats. Um, and, then, and then we do see it associated with higher rates of physical punishment. And then again, looking even further out at infant and toddler patterns, um, risk for reduced social engagement, uh, more fear and negativity and interactions with caregivers, and higher risk for internalizing and externalizing behaviors. Um, and of course, you know, children vary in their susceptibility to environmental exposures, including uh, parental um, uh, mental illness. But, but these are important risks that we need to think about when we talk about the scope of this problem and why it's important to address it. Next slide, please. Um, and so it's it's for this reason that uh, organizations like ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, uh, recommend screening and uh, for and addressing perinatal mental health problems. And these were recently updated in 2023. And so the new guideline actually recommends that screening should happen at that initial prenatal visit, later again in pregnancy, and then at postpartum visits, which is an increase in frequency from the original guideline. Um, if, and if you show the next slide, please, I just wanted to add an, another update. Um, ACOG now recommends considering screening for bipolar disorder for all patients uh, presenting with mood symptoms in the perinatal period. And they recommend, um, they recommend screening uh, before starting antidepressant treatment. Um, and this is really important. Uh, and I'll, I think on the next slide, I touch base on this a little bit more about bipolar disorder. Thank you so much. So we, we know that actually the perinatal period carries the highest lifetime risk for first onset of bipolar disorder. What that means is for patients who are presenting with a first mood episode in the perinatal period, we see actually higher rates of, of patients having an underlying bipolar disorder. And that's important because there's different risks associated with bipolar disorder. Um, the risks of discontinuing medication during pregnancy um, seem to be higher for patients with bipolar disorder. And then bipolar disorder itself is associated with increased risk for postpartum psychosis, which remains rare, but is of course very serious when it does occur. And we're gonna have later talks that are gonna more specifically talk about postpartum psychosis. Next slide, please. And I think, can I just ask, I think I have till 1220, is that right, Jody? Okay, thank you, just wanna make sure. Um, so again, we've tasked OBGYNs with screening for perinatal depression and anxiety, uh, but we've also tasked pediatricians with screening for parental depression, specifically maternal depression. So the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, recommends screening for maternal depression at the one, two, four, and six month visits, as well as a psychosocial assessment at every visit. Um, and really the pediatrician's role, because we're often asked this, is one of screening and referral there are cases in which the pregnant or postpartum person is the patient in the case of an adolescent who's pregnant. And so the pediatrician's role may include implementing first-line treatment. Next slide, please. All right, so we talked about perinatal depression. Well, what about perinatal anxiety? So um, perinatal depression overall is, is we have more data looking at risks associated with perinatal depression. We have increasing uh, data regarding perinatal anxiety and its risks. Um, we know that perinatal anxiety itself, whether clinical anxiety or subclinical, is, is really common. So having anxious thoughts during pregnancy is a common phenomenon. Um, and often these anxious thoughts are related to the pregnancy and the health of the fetus and the baby. Um, and most pregnant people who experience anxiety require no treatment beyond support. Um, but it's really important for us to be able to differentiate between typical anxiety that can occur in pregnancy, and what we would say is clinical anxiety or pathologic anxiety um, that is associated with increased risks and, and for which we have treatment. The next slide, please. Thank you. So even we know perinatal anxiety itself is common, but anxiety disorders are also common in the perinatal period. Um, so we're seeing rates that might be even as high as rates of perinatal depression. Um, but for generalized anxiety disorder, the data that we we have suggested about 10% um, of all women meet criteria for generalized anxiety disorder in pregnancy. Uh, and the highest rates seem to be around that first trimester, but of course it can occur at any point during or after pregnancy. And the strongest predictor of generalized anxiety disorder in pregnancy is history. 
generalized anxiety disorder. So women who had um, four or more episodes of generalized anxiety were about seven times more likely to experience anxiety in pregnancy. Um, and then we also see higher rates in birthing people who have high-risk pregnancies, uh, so five to seven times higher. So for our patients who are, who are experiencing high-risk pregnancy, they, they may be even more susceptible. Next slide, please. So then how do we determine, um, is this typical anxiety or is this a disorder? Um, and if you hit the next slide, I think it'll show up. So the first is, you know, anxiety that's intense. And the next, I'm sorry, I think I have a persistent, and I think there's one more, and impaired. So that's really what we're looking at when we're trying to differentiate between typical anxiety that might be occurring in pregnancy and might be responsive to just support and reassurance versus anxiety that requires treatment. Um, so anxiety that's excessive. Uh, you know, about a number of events or activities that, that the, the individual finds difficult to control. Um, there may be somatic symptoms like restlessness, fatigue, irritability, muscle tension, trouble concentrating, um, and disturbance in sleep. And then how much is this impacting that person's functioning? How impairing is it? So that's really what we're looking at when we're trying to differentiate. Next slide, please. So we, we do have some data, again, not quite as much as we have for perinatal depression, but regarding risks um, associated with, with untreated perinatal anxiety, including risk, high risk for preterm labor, low birth weight, um, some data regarding hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, spontaneous miscarriage, low APGAR scores at birth, and then um, breastfeeding or chest feeding difficulties. Um, and then anxiety during pregnancy is itself an independent risk factor for postpartum depression. So this is why it's so important that we're not just screening for depression uh, during pregnancy, but also screening for anxiety. Next slide, please. So we talk a lot about anxiety in pregnancy and stress, and we see these, these articles um, like these, right? Stress during pregnancy may harm an unborn baby's brain. How stress can affect you and your unborn baby. And I think we have to really think about the way that we talk about anxiety and stress in pregnancy. Because I think often it, it, it can send this message that if you are stressed, you are harming your baby. You need to stop being stressed. Um, and so I wanted to, to talk a little bit about how we think about studies of prenatal exposure to stress and anxiety. Um, next slide, please. So this is adapted from Catherine Monk, who is way more expert in, in this area than I, and she does a lot of research related to uh, prenatal exposures and stress, uh, prenatal stress. Um, and this is, uh, this is really adapted from how she talks about this, and I think it's so helpful. So one thing that she reminds patients as well as providers when talking about this is that experimental data doesn't always translate into clinical relevance. That's important to remember. Most birthing parents and their children are unaffected, um, right? Because we have to remember things like other parenting partners, other caregivers who also have an influence on that developing child. These factors are really a few of thousands that influence child development. And we also know they're not randomly distributed. So it's really, I think we too often think about the individual and what they're doing or not doing and less about the upstream factors that are impacting that individual. Uh, and so we need to think about the role of society, the need for societal changes rather than just individual solutions. Although individual solutions are important. She also reminds folks that usually level of exposures is typically high in order to see an effect and these effects are modifiable throughout development. So I just wanted to put that out there so that we can all keep that in mind when we think about how we, how we translate data to patients and how we talk about it with patients, providers, and other stakeholders. Um, next slide, please. I wanted to touch very briefly because we have such limited time. We can't go through all anxiety disorders. Any anxiety disorder can occur during pregnancy. Um, but perinatal OCD, there's some, some unique things about perinatal OCD there's actually a really high rate of subclinical OCD symptoms among birthing parents and their partners. It's actually really interesting. Um, but we also see um, relatively high rates of clinical OCD. So again, OCD can be new onset in the perinatal period, or it can be a, an exacerbation of pre-existing OCD. Up to 15% um, experience OCD at some point in their pregnancy or that first six months postpartum. The peak seems to be in those weeks following childbirth, but again, can occur at any point. And those obsessions that we see in perinatal OCD tend to be related to the newborn and causing harm to the newborn, either accidentally or intentionally, Those these obsessive thoughts. 
And the compulsions are often in the form of checking or mental compulsions. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, just some examples. Oops. There we go. Thank you. Um, just some examples because they can be really, um, really pretty upsetting for patients. And we can imagine why some, in some cases patients would be reluctant to talk to their provider about this. Um, so not just thoughts of eating something wrong that's going to cause harm, but or thoughts of the baby dying of SIDS, but even thoughts of dropping the baby, even on purpose, thoughts of putting the baby in a microwave, um, unwanted impulses, like this obsessive thought, I'm going to shake my baby. If I, if I pick her up, I'm just going to shake her. And you can think about all the consequences of this. It tends to lead to avoidance, right? It, it is very uncommon for patients. It would be a very low risk for patients to act on those obsessions. It's more fear. And that fear tends to um, translate to not wanting to touch the baby, asking others to take care of the baby, um, compulsive checking where I'm not sleeping because I'm compulsively checking the baby. Um, so if you go to the next slide, this is often an area where we're helping providers understand the difference between postpartum OCD and postpartum psychosis. So very briefly, um, postpartum psychosis is very rare as opposed to postpartum OCD, which we've just talked about can be quite common. Um, and the thoughts for, for a patient with with postpartum psychosis, um, the thoughts tend to be what we call egocentric, so perceived as being consistent with that person's own worldview. They tend to be fixed, so strongly believed, and they're delusional in quality, um, and they're not based in reality. Patients can also have hallucinations, of course, with postpartum psychosis. As opposed to postpartum OCD, even those thoughts can sound very overwhelming, those obsessive thoughts. They're egocentric, so the person rejects them. They're against their own worldview. They're distressing to the person. Um, they're not delusional, uh, and, and the patient does not experience hallucinations. That would not be associated with postpartum OCD. And again, for a patient with postpartum psychosis, one of the reasons it can be very dangerous to the, to the parent and to the infant is because there's a high risk of acting upon those delusional beliefs, whereas a very low risk in the case of a patient with OCD um, and postpartum psychosis is a, we call it a psychiatric emergency. It generally requires hospitalization and usually medications to treat, whereas patients with OCD is generally treated on an outpatient basis with therapy, plus or minus uh, an antidepressant. So I think that's where I ended. I went a little over, but I think that might be the end of my slides. Oh, it's very sweet. Thank you all for your attention. Great job. Thank you, Dr. Pinelli. Do we have a minute for questions. Does anyone have one or two questions they'd like to ask? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up postpartum OCD too, because we we see this a lot in practice, and I find that parents are almost embarrassed to talk about it because a lot of the intrusive thoughts and obsessive thoughts involve harming the infant, and so they get kind of scared to talk about it. So I think that's really important to bring up too. But we will... Dr. Zena raised her hand. Oh, sorry, Dr. Zena. That's okay. That's okay. I just wanted to comment that, you know, I... I think it's great that there's you know more systematic screening going on because some of these symptoms, especially of depression, can really overlap with what are common symptoms of pregnancy. So I think it's hard sometimes to tease out what's what's pregnancy and what's what's what are these other kinds of symptoms that are going on. So thank you. Yeah, also, thanks, Dr. Zena. Also, real quick, because you mentioned hospitalization for postpartum psychosis, um, Women's Hospital in Baton Rouge will be opening the first and only perinatal psychiatry unit for women, for pregnant women and postpartum women coming up in the upcoming months. So that's very exciting for the state of Louisiana. Thank you, Jen, for the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Finelli, for the, uh, the lecture presentation. It was all great. Thank you all so much for attending today. And, and like uh, Dr. Olivier said, the presentation, um, we're going to go ahead and we'll send an um, uh, email that has the recommendations, like Dr. Olivier said, but also the survey for the CEUs. And I believe Sienna is putting the CEU link in the chat um, if you want to go ahead and do it now, but I'll send it within the next day. Um, you do have a limited amount of time. I think it's 48 hours to be able to do your survey for your CEUs to count. So um, go ahead and do that as soon as you can, please, for your own benefit. Um, but our next session will be on Tuesday, April 23rd. Um, and the topic is going to be perinatal anxiety.
um, just a deeper dive with risk factors tools uh, to treat. And that's going to be given by Katie A. Bear, who's on our hub team as the social worker that she introduced herself earlier. So thank you. We hope to see you on April 23rd. And um, that email will come out, uh, come to you within the next 24 hours. So thank you all for your time. We'll stay on if there's additional questions, but reach out to us at any time. Have a good rest of your day. And a happy Easter. Happy Easter.